you are not the boss of me. Have you ever heard that? You've heard a child say that? I wasn't saying that to you right now. Some of you are like, wait a minute. No, that's not how we're starting the sermon. Maybe you've heard it with a little bit different of an inflection. You are not the boss of me. Or some variation of that. You've heard your child say it or a niece or a nephew or a grandchild, somebody. And it's an interesting phrase because grammatically, you know, that's not how we would normally say that. But it's been around for a very long time. So I started doing a little research because sometimes these things fascinate me. And I found that it has been around for at least 140 years. They found a comic strip from 1883 that said, you're not the boss of me. And it's just been passed down from generation to generation by children. They say it's child folklore, that it just keeps getting passed down. No adults need to intervene. At some point, somebody teaches them to say, you're not the boss of me. And you may be wondering, what does that have to do with the Bible? What does that have to do with God? But we've been studying the book of Exodus. And a couple weeks ago, we got to chapter 5. And Moses, the baby in the basket, has been raised and grown and left. And he's coming back. And he comes to Pharaoh like God told him to. And he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh responds and says, who is this Yahweh that I should obey him? Who is the Lord? This is chapter 5, verse 2. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. In essence, Pharaoh is saying, Yahweh is not the boss of me. The Lord is not the boss of me. Why would I listen to him? I have all of these other gods I subscribe to and listen to. In fact, in that culture, he himself would have been viewed as a god. And so he's like, I don't know this Lord, this Yahweh you're speaking of. He's not the boss of me. Well, Moses goes back and kind of has this moment where his people are upset with him and saying, what are we going to do? You made things worse because Pharaoh's like, in fact, not only am I not going to listen to him, you have to do way more work now. I'm going to add more work. You have to do more things in the same amount of time. And so the people are mad at Moses and Moses is talking to God and uh, God gives him some promises about who he is. And he once again reminds him of the name that he, he revealed to him a couple chapters earlier, that he is Yahweh, that he is the great I am, that I am that I am, that I will be that I will be. And part of that name and part of the theme of Exodus is that God is explaining, you will see who I am by how I behave. You will get an understanding of my nature through my character and through my actions. Observe. And see, part of the danger is this, is we pick up a view of God along the way too. We hear Bible stories or we read them or we've heard different pieces and we begin to build a mosaic. You guys know what a mosaic is? It's all of those little tiles that make up a bigger picture. And it's interesting to think about what is the picture of God that you have? What are the things that you've pieced together over time that, that frame how you see God? Some of you, because of your background and the churches you've been around, have a much stronger view of God's justice and wrath and, and all of the things that go with that, the fear of the Lord. And those are true. That's part of the picture. Some of us, depending on our background, have a high view of God's love and his grace and his mercy. And that's part of the picture too. But sometimes we can get out of balance because maybe we're only picking tiles from one area. And we don't have a robust picture of who God is. The good news is, Jesus says that he is the perfect picture of the Father. In fact, in John, it records this conversation. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. That's all we need. We just need to know who is God. Who really, what is he like? And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is saying, I am the perfect representation of God. If you're wondering what God is like and how he would act, look at me. He, he, I am the son of God. That is what Jesus is saying. And so it's good for us to study the Old Testament and how God reveals himself and then again make sure it lines up with the picture of Jesus, that we have a robust and healthy view of God because we're about to head into God revealing himself through judgment. And for some of us, we're like, yes, punish the wicked. Most of us have a little bit more of an apprehensive like feeling towards that. We're like, can I trust God? Is he safe? Is he, is he going to be mad at me? And what does that judgment look like? And we're going to unpack some of that this morning. Because as I said, Pharaoh says Yahweh is not the boss of me. And God is about to respond to that. So we're going to look at what is commonly known 
as the plagues. They're commonly called the ten plagues. Um, The word for plague is in there. Uh, It's kind of really this idea of ten strikes or ten actions from God. Um, But we can call them plagues because that's what we normally call them. And in chapter 7, verse 17, it says this. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. And again, Lord there is Yahweh. He's saying by this you will see that I am Yahweh. That phrase in some form shows up seven times in these four chapters of the ten plagues. So seven times God is explaining, hey, I'm showing you part of who I am right now by how I act. I'm, sh- I'm revealing part of myself through these actions. And so I love this, and I've spent so much time studying this. I could probably keep you here until this evening, uh, but I won't. Don't worry. It's beautiful outside, and we have lunch and friends. But I am going to spend some time unpacking the first nine. We're going to save the tenth plague for another week. And what's interesting is as you study it and as you dig in, you see that there's actually this, like, pre-demonstration that Moses has before the plagues start where he does the thing God had told him to do. You know, he had already showed the Israelites, he's like, look, the staff can turn into a snake, and that's why they get their hopes up. But then Pharaoh says no, and they're like, no, we're actually mad at you. And now he's going to go and do that before Pharaoh. And so this is chapter 7, verse 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing By their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So this is kind of a precursor to the 10. And so a lot of commentators and scholars have kind of framed the plagues as a 191 pattern, that the 10th plague is kind of set apart as different and separate, and that's why we're going to talk about it on another week, and that this is almost like the, the trailer or the prequel, this mini demonstration that Moses does before Pharaoh that kicks things off. And what's interesting is Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. They turn their staffs into snakes, but then we see that Aaron's staff eats the other snakes, which is just a little foreshadowing of what's about to happen and who the true God is. What's interesting, because if you're like me and you've been reading Exodus, you know, for the last six months (laughs) over and over and studying and reading commentaries is, why is God doing these specific things? Like, he could do anything. And as we read the Old Testament, we see him do a a lot of things. Like one of my favorites we talked about at one point was the Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal are like, send down the fire and nothing happens. And then Elijah's like, boom, and then like the whole thing burns. And it's like, God could just do that right now. But he like does 10 things. And they're interesting things. Like frogs, like what's, what's up with frogs? And like you start to wonder, what is God doing? But then you remember that phrase, I'm showing who I am. I'm showing you I'm the Lord. So what is God revealing about these things? What's cool is there's a pattern. And trust me, we're going to get to some practical application, but it's fun to dig in a little bit. So there's this chart, and this chart is the most simple one I could find. A lot of the commentaries have way bigger charts that kind of like show the patterns. And so what everybody says is that the plagues one through nine are really three groups of three, and that there's these patterns that repeat themselves. And these are just a few of the patterns. Is there forewarning? In the first two of every group of three, yes. You know, Moses is like, hey, if you you let us go, nothing's going to happen. And Pharaoh's like, no, stuff happens. The third time and the sixth time and the ninth time, there's no warning. Stuff just happens. Same with the timing. There's this pattern and, and where Moses is. So there's this repetitive nature. And so there seems to be so much intentionality about what God is choosing. But we're still left with the question, why? Why 10? Why these things? And I want to follow a couple threads that I think will give us a lot of understanding as to who God is and essentially why we should obey him. What is the answer to Pharaoh's question of, you're not the boss of me and why should I obey Yahweh is a, is a question that we should maybe ask. Why, why should we trust and obey God? And so the first thing I want to point out is that disobedience causes disorder. 
disobedience causes disorder. And I want to talk about that for a little bit in that scholars all point out, like one of the first things you read when you're reading a commentary on Exodus is that the plagues are a reversal of creation. That they're Chapters 7 through 10 in Exodus are a a mirror of what's going on in Genesis 1 and 2. And so that's kind of interesting to think about that, you know, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void and there was darkness and the spirit of God was hovering over the earth. And at the end of the ninth plague, it's just darkness that they've slowly worked their way backward through creation into chaos. That in the beginning, I love the line from the song we sang earlier, that you spoke and the chaos came to an end. That God speaks and creation begins to happen and he speaks again and it's good and it keeps getting better. And he creates things in a specific way. And what moves from chaos into order is called good by God. And what we see happening here through the plagues is the reversal of that. That what is in order begins to become more chaotic and disordered. That there's disintegration where there was integration. And so I want us to realize that disobedience causes disorder. That we go from the pre-creation chaos to creation backwards. That we see that when we disobey, it's going against the very fabric of the way things are created. What a lot of people like to point out too is that the beginning, they, they almost are natural. They're They're supernatural in that they happen in Moses' timing and things like that, and they are miraculous, but there's some amount of it that isn't too shocking at first. They increase in severity and intensity as they go. But some people know that when the Nile would flood, it would actually turn red sometimes because of the sediment, and there is actually recording, too, of when it flooded one time and it was really red and all this stuff. It's really cool. It's fun to dig into. But at first, they start out more mild, and it's like, why would... Why would God hold back? Why, why is it slow? We're going to get into that more in a minute. And I think what I was reflecting on is that when we go against the way God created things, which is disobedience, when we go against the moral fabric of the way he created the world, we've all experienced how that creates chaos, disorder. Maybe it's in small amounts. Maybe it's in large amounts. Maybe it's social, maybe it's relational, maybe it's internal, maybe it's emotional. But as we disobey God, we experience disorder in our life. And it reminded me of when we did a series on Proverbs a while back, and we studied and talked about this idea of hokma. Hokma is the Greek or the Hebrew word for wisdom. And it carries with it in the beginning of Proverbs this idea of going with the flow of the way God created things. That's why Proverbs is full of principles. They're not all promises, but they're like, hey, when you do this, this is typically how it goes. Raise your child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. That's a general flow of wisdom. And so the idea here is that when you're obeying God and going down the lazy river of wisdom, things are generally going well. And when you turn around and you fight the current, you begin to experience that disorder, that chaos. That things move from smooth to more chaotic. We've experienced this, right? Maybe it was a small thing. We just didn't tell the truth. But that grew into other things. And it grew into a lack of trust in a relationship. And there was a ripple effect from that small disobedience. Maybe it's more, it's bigger than that. Maybe it's, uh, hey, I, I had unforgiveness. That I know God asks me to forgive, and that goes with the wisdom, and it goes with obedience, and it goes with what God has created things, and that's what he tells me. But this person did this thing, and I I just can't. I I don't want to. I refuse to. And we experience that own, our own inward decay. That that disobedience causes inward disorder, and that relationally there's a separation and barrier, and things just get worse. So there's this idea That when we follow God and obey him, things generally go well. And when we choose to disobey, they generally head towards chaos. So we see this imagery of creation reversal. As as Pharaoh digs in his heels, things get more and more chaotic. I think we see this with generosity. When we choose to hold on to what we have, 
we see a breakdown of what could be. But when we live with open arms as God calls us to, we see the flourishing around us, which is what creation is called to, is called to flourish. I think sometimes we have this picture of God where he's angry and when we do something wrong, he's just punishing us. But if there's actually a way that he intentionally created things and that he loves you and actually wants you to flourish. And Jesus in John 10 says, I came that you may have life and life to the full or abundant life. I love that picture. That if Jesus, like we said, is the perfect representation of the Father, God's heart for us is to flourish. That you would have abundant life. That you would go with the moral fabric he created and obey him. And we think sometimes that it's just like God's mad because I, I just want to do my own thing and he's mad that I'm doing that and he just wants to punish me. A good illustration, or it falls short, but something to give us a picture is if you went to the doctor and the doctor was like, hey, your, your cholesterol is out of control and this thing and that is bad and you need to stop eating french fries three times a day. You need to stop, I don't know what they say, you need to stop doing this and start doing that and they give you all these orders and you leave and you go home and you're like, can you believe the doctor? That was a major power trip. They're just telling me what to do. They, they're the worst. It's like, no, the doctor maybe just knows better that if you do this, it's going to actually be beneficial for you. And that falls short, of course, because the doctor had to study, and God is actually the creator of all of these principles. He's the creator of all of the ways and the things that he's calling us to do. And although it might go against what we want, it's what's truly best for us. And so I think it's helpful. I, I like Proverbs 4. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. This idea of holding close God's words, because it says, For they are life to those who find them, and health to one's whole body. Disobedience causes disorder. It causes chaos. But obedience is like healing medicine. It's like, a honeycomb on our lips. It's like just a breath of fresh air. And I think some of us have that, that tantrum that we see toddlers have where we say, God, you're not the boss of me. Why are you telling me not to do that thing I don't want to do? And we all as parents know it's because we know better. That's what you tell your little kid. Just trust me. I wonder if we would be willing to trust God that he actually knows best, that, that disobedience leads to disorder and that it's better to obey him. The second thing I want to point out is that our idols always fall short. The first reason to obey God is because it's going to be easier. It's generally better. Things are going to go well overall. It's, it's wisdom. The second thing is, is that our idols always fall short. And as much as we see a decreation or uncreation or a reversal of Genesis 1 and 2 in the plagues, we also see a direct a front to the Egyptian gods. We see that he's one by one picking them off. And a lot of people say at this time there's probably like 114, give or take, you know, a dozen. There's a lot of Egyptian gods at this time. And, and he is po purposely, Yahweh, our God, is showing his power over them. And so the first one, we're not going to read all four chapters. We don't have time to go through it all. But we will read some of them. The first one is blood. Moses shows up at the Nile River. He meets Pharaoh there. And this is what it says in verse 16. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. We talked about this earlier in the series, how we're always called from this to that. It's just not freedom as a whole. It's, it's worshiping the wrong thing to worshiping the right thing. Slavery from one thing to slavery to God, which is true freedom. Let them go that they may worship me. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and over the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. This is a disaster. I mean, like, just this is not good for the economy. This is not good for life in Egypt. This is in seven days this goes on. It says a week passes. Can you imagine that if, like, your whole ecosystem is built on the Nile River and it's filled with blood and even your jars and reservoirs are filled with blood? 
what's interesting is there's a few things happening here. One, if you remember early in the story, Pharaoh was like, throw all the firstborn sons in the river, in the Nile. And this is almost a reversal of the evil that he committed coming back. That the, the Nile turned to blood. And it made me just re- think of that phrase where our sin finds us out. And so the Nile is what the economy was based on. It was, life was dependent on it. One commentary said, the first plague was directed against the numerous Egyptian river deities. The Nile itself was virtu- virtually worshipped as a god by the Egyptians. And the Lord God shows that he has complete power over the Nile, not some river god. That he is truly in power. The Egyptian god, Num, was said to be the guardian of the Nile. It showed he was unable to protect his territory. The god Happy was said to be the spirit of the Nile that brought the flood that brought the new season of harvest. He was brought low by this plague. The great god Osiris was thought to have the Nile as his bloodstream. In this plague, he truly bled. The Nile itself was worshipped as a god. And there are papyri, like manuscripts that we have, recording hymns sung to the praise of the river of that time. And so this is God showing Not only does disobedience cause chaos, and as you go against me, things unravel, but he is showing that our idols and where we put our trust outside of him always fall short. Our idols always fall short. And so they were trusting in the Nile River, and Yahweh is showing I'm I'm more powerful than that. We're not worshiping the Fox River. That's not our current context. In fact, many of us are grossed out by it sometimes. But we do have things that we rely on and trust in and put our hope in and maybe rely on a little too much. And it is God's kindness when he shows up and reminds us, that thing doesn't protect you. It's his love that actually removes it and reminds you, hey, I'm the one who actually provides. There's no one in charge of the Nile above me. And so this is his first affront against the Egyptian gods. And then the frogs come. Same thing. There's a god of the frogs. There's a goddess, actually, who her head was a frog. And they, they, they saw frogs as sacred. Um, and so it also blurs the lines of earth and water, which is the reversal of creation where that line gets blurred and God sets the boundary. Um, and then the next one, we're just moving along quickly because otherwise we're going to be here all day. Gnats. Gnats come. Some translations call them lice. I think gnats is probably more accurate. And you can see the progression. If, if everything in the river dies because there's blood in there for seven days, then it's going to stink and the frogs are going to come out of the river. And so the, at this point, this is why Pharaoh's not so convinced. He's like, hmm, one thing's leading to another. This is bad, but I'm not convinced yet. Frogs come out and then there's gnats everywhere. They're just all over. And this is what it says in Exodus 8, 18. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Because at this point, they had done everything else. They did the same thing with the blood. They did the other stuff with the frogs, which only made the problem worse. They just added more frogs. But (laughs) this is the first one that they can't recreate. They're like, I don't know how he's doing that. And since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. The magicians recognize it before Pharaoh does. And they're saying, "This, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Can you imagine? A plague of gnats would be so annoying. I don't know if you've ever, like, walked by the river when they're, like, everywhere. Or, like, we were walking in East Dundee not that long ago, and we were by the river, and um, our daughter was just like, (laughs) you know, like that thing when they're, like, all in your face and in your mouth and stuff? But just everywhere, all the time, gnats. The next one is flies. Flies, similarly, would, would just be so annoying, spread everywhere, just constant. And what happened is this would disrupt their way of worship. See, Egyptians would sacrifice certain things, but their rules was that if it had lice or gnats or flies, which are all the things that just came, they couldn't sacrifice it. They couldn't sacrifice that thing. And now everything has that. So God is showing his power once again. He's saying, hey, you worship the Nile, I'm more powerful than those gods. Hey, you, you worship the frogs, I'm more powerful than that. And hey, you, your whole system is going to break down because I'm more powerful than, than that. And we also see this is the first time the Israelites get set apart. We don't know if it's happening or not before, but this is the first time it's mentioned. That it says in Goshen, where the Israelites were, there were no flies. 
God, God sent flies everywhere except where his people were. Pharaoh, at this point, he's like, all right, maybe we can compromise. Verse 25, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said, that would not be right. He's like, just do your sacrifices here. You guys don't need to leave and do it. Just do it right here. And Moses is like, we can't do that. The sacrifices we offer to the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. Like our way of doing it and the way that you guys would do it, it just, it won't work. And it's a reminder that that partial obedience isn't obedience anyways. And Pharaoh's always trying to get that compromise and be like, can you do this? And Satan does the same thing for us. He's like, just like a little bit of a compromise, not full out. And we, I, I was reflecting on this this week too and just how like the fear of the Lord comes when we start to see God, who God really is. But, and that's wisdom. Because, you know, we're talking about hokma, moving with the moral fabric. Wisdom says, wisdom comes and starts from the fear of the Lord. But in Proverbs 8, it says, the fear of the Lord is to hate what is evil. That as, as followers of Jesus, we actually have to hate what is wrong. We don't, we don't hate people ever. That is very clear in scripture. But, but we don't like what is evil. And so we run from it because we have a fear of the Lord. We want, we want what he wants. And so the fifth plague comes, and that's diseased livestock. This is the first more like plague plague, the way we would think of plague. It's like a disease, and it, it gets all of their livestock, which would be an attack against the Egyptian god Hathor, who was thought to be the mother goddess in form of a cow. In fact, there's, there's an Egyptian uh, story where another uh, group came to fight the Egyptians and put all of their co- cows in front of their front row of army, and the Egyptians just left because they wouldn't hurt the cows. So, like, this is a very sacred thing for them, and God gives all of them this plague, all the livestock. There's is this idea that, no, even that, another thing you worship, I'm more powerful than. The next is boils. Moses throws dust into the air or soot from, like, the fireplace, and it turns into boils on everybody, on Pharaoh and all over the place, which you can see, again, that creation reversal where from dust. And it's just a beautiful picture of God doing two things. Hey, disorder happens in disobedience. There's a reversal of the natural way things are created. There's natural consequences. And also, I'm showing everybody that I am the true God. I'm revealing myself. This is the first time that it it talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Up to this point, every time Pharaoh has hardened his own heart. We're going to get a little bit more into that in in two weeks because there's a lot to unpack there with the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. So some of you are like, oh, man, well, just come back to church. It'll be fine. (laughs) This was also an affront against the Egyptian god Emotep, you know, who was the god of medicine, saying, no, there is no god of medicine other than Yahweh. He is the one in control. The next one is hail. And I want to read a bit of this one. We're covering like four chapters, so I've been summarizing a lot of it. But there's a lot that happens during this hail moment. So we're going to read together. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. Or this time, I will send the full force of my plagues against you. Did you guys notice that full force? I didn't notice that the first time. Like, I I read it, but like, one of the times it just stuck out to me more. That like, God is clearly saying, I, this, this hasn't even been my best. I've already defeated all of your best But I I have been, like, holding back. I've been patient. We're going to come back to that idea in a minute. He says, I'll send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know there was no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. Which is what we said in the beginning. We're like, if God was just about judgment, this would have already been dealt with. This would be over already. That there's something else God is doing here. He said, but I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt. From that day, it was founded until now. He's like, of all time, this is going to be the worst storm. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field and they will die. That's gracious. God's saying, hey, I'm going to move things up a level. He's like, but I'm warning you. And if you want to bring your livestock in and people in, they'll be protected. 
which is so gracious of God because this is already many plagues in. And he's like, I'm, I'm leveling things up. He's like, but I'm also giving you an opportunity to avoid it. I'm letting you know it's coming this time, tomorrow. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. So you see Egypt even. Some of the Egyptians have been like, this is the finger of God, the magician said. And others are starting to recognize, hey, this is, this is bigger than anything we've experienced. We're going to do what he says. We're going to bring our livestock in. But Pharaoh ignored. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on the people and animals and everything growing in the fields. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt and hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. We see that God is still intensifying things. We see the reversal of creation and it's again, once again, fighting against one of the Egyptian gods. Um, knew it, the sky goddess. Um, this would have been the scariest one for them yet. This is the most dangerous one they've seen so far. At this point, you think they would start to get it. And so there is almost a moment where you think Pharaoh's going to get it. He has this like false repentance where he's like, he actually asks Moses to pray for him. And he has this moment where it seems like something's going to change, but it doesn't. And I was reflecting on that and I thought about how Sometimes we just want the consequences to stop. We're not actually sorry about our disobedience. And that's really what is going on with Pharaoh right now. He's just like, I'm just going to do what I need to do to get this to stop. I'm not actually going to follow Yahweh. I'm not going to change my ways. I'm not going to change my mind. In, verse, in chapter 5, when he first came and said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? He's starting to see who God is. That he is actually more powerful than any of the other gods he's worshipped. He's also seeing that he's gracious and saying, hey, if you want to avoid it, let my people go. But even if you aren't letting my people go, you can still save your livestock. It's gracious of God. He's shown himself more powerful than many Egyptian deities at this point. And then we get to the locusts. The locusts, once again, similar idea, disrupt the worship system. Uh, and it confronts the protector of the crops. They have another god for that because they have a lot of gods. And then finally, we're to darkness. We're just going to skip the locust really quick. Mentioned it. On to darkness. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of like darkness where you're like, it's like tangibly dark. It's like so dark. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Um, it's, it's a whole other thing. And it's one thing when it's like that in the middle of the night or you're in your basement and somebody turned off the lights because they didn't know you were down there or whatever it might be. It's another thing to be living in that and have darkness all the time. What's cool, though, is this is another one where we see the Israelites don't get it. They, they're spared, that they have lights. In verse 23, no one could see anyone else or move about for three days, three days pitch black, yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. That's so cool. And so there's one plague left. Maybe you know it, the famous one, the 10th one. We're going to get to that in a couple weeks. Um, but I want to remind us, disobedience leads to disorder. That it is an unraveling of the way God created things. We also know that our idols fall short. And the last thing I want to point us out is that he is a gracious judge. That he's gracious. He didn't go instantly as harsh as he could. He didn't immediately just do whatever he needed to do. He didn't smite Pharaoh instantly or any of those things. He's increment, incrementally uh, intensifying, revealing his nature and character. He's showing that he's gracious. It reminds me of 1 Peter, and it talks about how God is patient, and not patient in the way that we would think, that he's patient in wishing that no one would perish. That it's his heart that actually everybody would turn to him. That, that everybody would repent. And, and so he's giving time and he's being gracious and he's showing his nature. And we see clearly that what is judgment actually brings salvation. Obviously for the Israelites, 
because ultimately after the 10th plague, they're let go. But also even for some of the Egyptians, that along the way, some of them said, this is God. And, and they started to, to see the freedom and benefit of obeying Yahweh, even though it wasn't intended for them, which is a beautiful picture. And so we come back to that initial question that Pharaoh asks, who is this Yahweh that I should obey him? That opening question when he's upset, and he, he's saying, who, who is Yahweh? He's not the boss of me. He's now getting a different picture of who God is. Our three points give us three reasons to obey God. First, disobedience causes disorder. It's, it's just wise to obey God. It's the wise thing to do. Right. It'll make your life generally easier. Sometimes there's things that are difficult about obedience. I'm not saying there's not a cost to following Jesus. Jesus says count the cost. But overall, it is wise to follow Jesus. The second thing, our idols always fall short. God is worthy. He's king of the universe. He's shown himself more powerful than anything else they had put their trust in. For us, it's not local gods. Maybe it's money or power or relationships or whatever it might be. These things we put our trust in, God is, is above those things. He's worthy to be obeyed. And depending on our personality, different things are going to catch us differently. Some of us are like, I just, I'm going to do the wise thing. Some of us are like, I need to know that he is the authority. But it's all of us need all these. And the last one, he's a gracious judge. He, he's not just worthy because he's king. He's worthy because of his character. He loves us. That he's gracious, wishing that all would turn in repentance. And like we said in the beginning, when God is revealing who he is through these plagues, we're just getting one mosaic tile of the big picture. And that picture is fulfilled in Jesus when Jesus says, I am the perfect representation of the Father. And we see that Jesus didn't just come to judge. He came to bear judgment. To take our judgment. The judgment we deserved. In fact, on the cross, we get another moment of darkness. When Jesus breathes his last and commits his spirit, we read in Matthew 27 that all of the earth is dark. That rocks split and the earth quakes. That in that moment, when he takes the wrath of God, the judgment of God, it's the same thing. It's the reversal of creation. In that moment, things go black. And Jesus takes the judgment that we deserve. That we serve a God who is just. That he's not just a God who lets wickedness go, but he's also a God who's willing to take the punishment for that wickedness so that things and people can be reconciled to him. He's a gracious judge. He loves us. And so I think sometimes we are like those toddlers who are like, you're not the boss of me. We don't say it or we don't even think it, but we have areas that we're willing to obey God and areas that we are slow to surrender. Maybe it's easy to forgive for you, but hard to be generous. Maybe it's easy to be generous, but you hold a grudge like nobody's business. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe I don't know what it is. But the question remains, is there an area that you're not willing to obey? Is there an area that you're slow to surrender to God? I just want to remind you, hey, it's the wise thing. He's worthy and he loves you. We don't just obey and think he's on a power trip like our doctor. We obey because it is the best thing for us and it's who he is. And I was thinking about this and as I was ending the, my, typing out my notes, this old hymn came to my mind. Many of you might remember it, the old hymn, Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That idea that Jesus came to give life and life abundantly, we find that in obedience. We find that abundant life in moving in the direction God is calling us to move. The verse goes, when we walk with the Lord in light of his word, which means we have to know his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. 
That when we trust and obey, he's with us. And then the next verse, but never, but we never can prove the delights of his love until on the altar we lay. That there is surrender in this. That obedience takes surrender. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Lord, I love you. Please help me to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. The chorus one more time, trust and obey. Those things go hand in hand. It's hard to obey if you don't trust. And that's why only viewing God through the lens of judgment only works for short periods because you don't trust, you just fear. And fear is important. We need the fear of the Lord. We need to see who he is. But we can trust when we see not only is he worthy, but it's wise and he loves us. That it's the best thing for us. So, are you willing to trust and obey? Is there an area you need to trust him more fully? Is there an area that he's speaking to you about obeying fully? I want to pray for us to not only have the courage to do those things, but the help by his spirit to follow through on those things. Because the beauty of it is he doesn't ask us to do it on our own. He says, hey, not only will I take the punishment, I'm also going to give you the power to do what I'm asking you to do because I love you and I want you to experience the fullness of life that I offer. So we're going to pray that God would give us the ability. But before we do that, I just want to throw it out there that if you have never decided to follow Jesus initially, you've been working against that stream, that lazy river unintentionally. That there might be areas of your life where you're doing things God's way without knowing it because you don't know God and that you see blessing there. Because I'm not saying you can't experience a good life without God. I'm just saying you can't experience the fullness of it. The full magnitude of his blessing. And so if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, to say, hey, I've been like Pharaoh and hardened my heart. I've done things my own way, but I need forgiveness. I see that you're just, but you're also loving. That, that it's not just a free pass, that you actually took the punishment I deserved so that we could have relationship. Ephesians, a letter written by the, written by the Apostle Paul says, for by grace, which is a free gift, you have been saved through faith. That is just trusting that he's doing this. It's that trust and obey. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of works, that there's nothing you can do to earn it. So no one can brag about it. It's a free gift of God. And so if you need to receive that gift today because you've never received it before, that gift of saying, hey, I, I, I want to obey God. I want to turn. That's what repentance is. The Bible says repent. It's just turning. It's saying, hey, I want to move in the direction that God is calling me to move. And I need forgiveness for my sins. It's as simple as praying in your own words and saying, God, I need you to forgive me. I receive your grace and forgiveness. I receive your new life. And I receive your spirit to be adopted into your family. Would you make me brand new and help me to live for you? If that's you this morning and you want to pray that in your own words, I'd love for you just to raise your hand enough for me to see, just so that I could be praying with you. Is there anybody who's ready to make that decision for the first time? today. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that we can receive forgiveness through the cross. God, we admit our need for forgiveness, acknowledge that we have fallen short of your standard, that we have done things our own way. We have hardened our hearts in different ways. And God, so we ask that you would help us, that you would forgive us. And for those who are followers of you already, God, would you enable us to do the things you're asking us to do? Would we trust and obey? because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. So God, we ask for conviction where we need conviction and then forgiveness in that area of conviction and then in enabling by your spirit to be made more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.